I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my life living in Latin America. I'm here in Nicaragua in my office, and I know a lot of you have been asking me to get out and show more of Nicaragua. Get out and do some walking. I haven't done enough recently. I totally agree, and I just ran out of time today, and I had to get this out, but I did have some viewer questions that I wanted to answer, so I'm making the best of the fact that I'm stuck in the office. So I apologize. I don't have any walking around cool stuff to show today. I'm going to do my best to have something to show tomorrow, but it has been a busy week. I took my wife and kids to Managua for a couple days, to go just enjoy being in the city. We love doing that as a family. We go and check out new restaurants, do some shopping. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that, just real quick, uh, because there's some interesting stuff about living in Nicaragua, I think, that we'll cover. And then we're going to get into two questions from Andrea York, who actually asked me them while I was in Argentina, and I haven't had a chance to get to them because, honestly, I forgot that she had asked. So she asked again. I'm going to answer them today, and we're going to get to those right after the bump. Before I delve into Andrea's questions, so we went to Managua and we do this quite often. Both of my daughters really enjoy going into the big city and there's just a lot more to do. Leon's a small town, uh, even you know, it's 300,000 people, but in Central America, that's not a large city and it doesn't give you a lot of variety. Our food options, our shopping options are just kind of repetitive. The quality's good, prices are great, but variety is low. Managua is a big city, 1.3 plus million people, and the whole country heads into there for stuff. So even um, beyond what you would expect in a city of that size, it really is the variety for about four to five million people who live relatively easily within reach of it because Leon, Granada, Messiah, e even the mountain cities and, and all of the, the central cities, right, they all can get there pretty quickly. So it has a lot of the variety of especially shopping, but also restaurants that you would get within the country. And so we love to go there and, and spend time um, and it provides an important bit of variety for us. So a few things that we did. One, so we finally got a chance. I I know my wife has been there, but my, the kids and I have not been able to go in yet. We went to the actual official. This is the actual name. It's a brand of a chain, the flagship of the China Mall. These are relatively new. Uh, it's built on the, the, the Pisa Suburbana, it's very accessible. It is a giant three-story shopping center. You can't film in any of these. So at some point, I'll try to sneak you some stuff. I got a few like photos, but that's like it. But this was impressive. I had no idea. It's nothing like the ones we have here in Leon, which are like, oh, we got some like random assortments of things. This is what we were able to get cheap. So if we got what you need, great. If not, yeah. Right. So the ones here, like a whole aisle of just umbrellas. Like, okay, that's that's useful, but I, what if that's not what I'm looking for? Well, it's that or keychains. That's what we have this week. At the China Mall in Managua. It's really a mall. You've got a floor on top that I didn't even get to go to with sporting goods and exercise stuff, that kind of stuff. And the first floor had, had a good food selection, quite a bit more than I was expecting for sure, which again, not a lot of food variety in Nicaragua in general. So having the China Mall where it's tons of, of authentic Chinese drinks and snacks and food items and ramen and pre-made dinners and things like this, it's a, it's, a, it's a reasonably large selection of really interesting foods. And um, I wonder how much popularity there is around this in Nicaragua? Or is there a lot of Nicaraguans that are like, what is this? Or are they like, variety, this is amazing. I don't know. But we buy a lot anytime we go. And my wife has brought home several selections from the China Mall. And we're always like, this is so much fun. And we enjoy the food. And, and we're trying to experiment. Some things we're just finding interesting. Some of them we really like. But so we bought tons uh, to to experiment with. And I loved getting to see the selection. Like it was just so much bigger than I thought. And they have just basically everything. It is like a mall. It's three stories. It's a department store with separate areas. So they have lots of clothing and shoes and pet products and, uh, you know, jewelry and, and, and perfume and makeup and, um, you know, little kids stuff and toys and just you name it, you're, you've got a ton of shopping. So it's actually a really important addition to our overall shopping. It's not like I was picturing, and I think a lot of people are, that um, you typically get what we call Chinese shops are like uh, five and dimes in the old days or dollar stores today. And certainly a lot of this stuff is very affordable, but some of it is kind of expensive. Like the food is not 
cheap food. This is like specialty food.、Um, so a lot of the things that were there are kind of unique items or or nice items or just a variety that we don't normally get. So having access to that variety、uh, as someone who lives in Nicaragua is actually a really big deal. We have a decent amount of shopping in Managua, but this adds to it significantly in a very convenient, very centralized. An affordable location, and the customer service was nice. They have a fountain there with with fish and turtles, and I think it was actually quite nice. I was very impressed by the whole thing. So the kids enjoyed it,、um, and we bought a lot of stuff, and that was just a fun shopping thing. So that's something I will try in the future to show as much as I can. But when you're talking about shopping in Managua, it's important to remember that China Mall, the main location on the suburbana, and it has an alternative location、um, in or near Plaza Once、uh, that's smaller, and there's all there's competing. China stores throughout the country, but this is the big one. Like they really, I've, there's nothing like this、uh, that I'm aware of anywhere else. So that that was super cool.、Uh, we also、uh, we went to Limoncello, which I did one other time, and the last time I was at Limoncello, I got recognized by one of you. And this time we went to Limoncello and got recognized by one of you, but someone new, someone I talked to a couple weeks ago while I was in Argentina, Mark McKnight. And、uh, so, shout out to Mark. Great meeting you there at Limoncello. Limoncello is this really cool coffee shop. It's just off Plaza Central America. If you're checking the map, and it is, it's a little quirky cafe, right? Uh, Limoncello is a weird name. It is a lemon-themed cafe,、uh, but it doesn't serve alcohol, so it doesn't have limoncello. That's a little bit weird. But other than that, it is the most beautiful location. It feels like you're nestled in a backwoods kind of thing, in the middle of the like right in the middle of the city. Really interesting, but they do a great job. So we went there, got some food, got coffee, hung out,、um, and talked to Mark. Mark recommended a place for dinner, so that was cool. That was the first time my wife got to go to Limoncello because the kids and I have gone before, but she was shopping instead.、Uh, so this time we all got to hang out. And then we went. We we stayed at the Double Tree, which we often use.、Um, checked in there, and then late in the evening we went out to dinner at this place that Mark had recommended to us. And it's actually up the hill. I showed it in one of my walks of the Via、uh, Via Fontana Sur,、uh, right where it turns into Aurora. There was a plaza with a coffee shop and a pizza place. This is that pizza place. It's a bistro. Up in this plaza, up in the really out of the way hills above Managua, with like cooler temperatures and nice breezes. It was beautiful. It's a very tiny place. They have pizza and pasta. That's it, and some dessert.、Um, but it was the pizza was excellent. Really impressed. The pasta was good. Service was amazing. Location is really cute. Outdoor seating. Great weather because you're up getting a breeze. This is where Nicaragua gets really nice, right? When you can get up into the hills, Nicaragua gets really nice. There's just not a lot of population up that high. So that was really nice. We sat outside. It was super pleasant. Rained at the at the end, but most of it was was perfect. And, and we were covered, so even in the rain, it was very nice, very comfortable.、Uh, and、uh, so that was a great recommendation. Thank you, Mark. And、um, so that was. Our, our first evening, and then、uh, the next day we went and checked out. Went to the Barrio Cafe, but missed it for breakfast. That's what we wanted to get for breakfast. We love that as a breakfast place, but for lunch, as veg- vegetarians, very weak. Best hummus around. Just in case anybody's wondering. Then we went to、uh, Zacata.、Um, I'm gonna get this wrong. Zacata Lemon, which is right across from the BDF and Asa buildings, and it's in kind of a Um, nice, but not super flashy、uh, plaza, and you kind of drive by, and you're like, "Yeah,、oh, that's kind of a thing." And I've been kind of looking at it for years. We've never gone, and so this time I'm like, "Hey, let's, this menu looks like it's got plenty of things for us. We should try it out." And then you know, the kids are like, "Okay, we're okay with that. We didn't really have something chosen, so we went there at about one o'clock. So we did kind of a, a late breakfast snack at Barrio Cafe, and then we did a late lunch, real lunch at、uh, Zacata Limon." And、uh, it actually had a wait line. We had to wait like 15 minutes to get a table. The place was absolutely packed, super loud. No idea this was there, and it's not cheap for four people. Our lunch is about seventy-two dollars. That's after tip and tax, but wow!、Uh, but it was excellent. We had salmon sandwiches. They have、uh, uh, falafel bowls. They have a really big menu with a lot of stuff and really high quality ingredients that are hard to find. This is a specialty place. There's a reason it was packed. We're very impressed. We're definitely going back. So a couple restaurants and shopping items, all new、uh, for us, and that's one of the things. It's just so much fun for us as a family is discovering that new stuff. Hopefully the sound isn't too bad. We got pouring rain as I'm recording this, but that was that was our our time in Managua. I'm sorry. 
didn't film it, but I was really spending time with family and didn't have a lot of extra time. So I was focused on family time and I apologize that uh, I just had to describe it, but I did think that those items were worth sharing with you because it gives you a little bit of why we like Managua, what we like, what we're discovering. And for us, just food and accommodations and shopping, like we like going into the city and just doing these things, hanging out at cafes, soaking in the city because the city is really nice and we enjoy it. All right. So to get to Andrea's questions, she has two kind of general purpose questions about Nicaragua and life here. So question number one, Nicaraguan people generally are so friendly and welcoming, but there's a socioeconomic disparity that makes it difficult to become friends. How do you navigate this? So I think the first most important piece here is just, I don't know that we consciously navigate it, right? <laughs> so uh, I don't, I don't want to have that impression that that's like a thing that we've like sat down and said, how are we going to navigate this? Um, I think... When you look at Nicaragua, and this, this goes for any place, right? Just, just specifically, uh, in this case, if you're looking at Nicaragua and you're looking at living in, for example, an enclave like San Juan del Sur or Grand Pacifica, or you're looking at living in a gated community with other expats, or you're living in an area that's just loaded with expats, Granada, for example, uh, which is not an enclave, but has a lot of expats and a lot of tourists. There's a very us and them, just natural situation that arises. That's expected, not weird, like it kind of goes without saying. In those cases, how do you make friends? It's a little bit of a challenge, but it's, it's, it's not an insurmountable challenge. I don't want to make it sound like it is. It's in those situations, there is a us and them kind of thing. You have your world that you go home to and then at night or, you know, whatever you go out and you want to hang out with Nicaraguans. And so you end up with a, your life and their life and you navigate between the two. Nothing wrong with that. Perfectly acceptable. Lots of people are doing that. And, and, and of course, some people, like we talked about on the show this week, end up in a, our life and never try to navigate that or never end up navigating that. And they just go into their enclave, go into their gated community and never leave. Um, and that creates one lifestyle. And then there's this back and forth that a lot of, that one's pretty rare. There isn't that much of that. And then you have these group of people that want American style housing, American style living arrangements, things like that, right? And then want to be able to go hang out with uh, make Nicaraguan friends and and explore the Nicaraguan lifestyle and take part in Nicaraguan activities. And so they're they're staying at home at night, well during the day, whenever, and then going maybe for breakfast, maybe for going out, maybe for weekend activities into the Nicaragua world. And then there are some. This is definitely the minority. I would I would think are living, and this is where I fall, completely in a Nicaraguan world. I'm living in a barrio. I'm living in, I am in a gated community. I am in any kind of exclusive spot, but I'm the only expat here. Like everybody is Nicaraguan. And I'm in a barrio, which does have a very large barrio, does have other expats, but extremely few. There's just a handful of us. Um, and, and most that are here are just coming and going. They, they like to check it out and then they are just looking for where they want to be next. Um, and so I think if you're living the way that I do, uh, the idea that you need to navigate that the socioeconomic disparity is an impact for you, actually, I don't think it is. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I don't think it creates this barrier um, to making friends in Nicaragua. And one of the reasons that I think that is, and I've talked about this, especially when I'm on some walks. So if you're watching just the right walking videos where I'm going through some neighborhoods, sometimes I talk about how in a lot of neighborhoods, like barrios, like, you know, kind of poorer areas, typically, um, you have a lot of houses that are like, okay, this is, you know, People are living okay, but this isn't great housing. And then you come across a house in the middle of the block that's like, ooh, twice the size of the others, way more fancy. Others are like just, you know, painted concrete walls, which is fine. But then this next one's like carefully manicured tile walls or or faux bricks or rocks or whatever. And something really, someone really put an effort into an expensive outside facade, not just painting the, the building material. And and maybe it's it's a much bigger building and you can tell that there, there's a garage with a car in it rather than just a space that someone's using for a workshop or whatever. And you have like a, wow, why is this place so much more expensive in the middle of this block? It clearly stands out. And often the answer is when people change socioeconomic status in Nicaragua, they often don't leave their community. They, you know, if someone grows up and they're just in a lower income family, but, you know, doing fine, that they're, they're safe, they get a good education, they do all that stuff. And maybe their parents are earning you know, X and they're able to afford a house, but they're multi-generational in the house and it's a big family in the neighborhood 
and uh, you know they're poor, but but they're doing well. Then the kid goes and, and ends up becoming a doctor, or or opens a shop that does really well, and they make quite a bit of money. They generally don't go, okay, and I'm out of here, and and leave and leave their family and go move to some really fancy neighborhood. It can happen, but it's not generally what's happening, unless they're like, oh, my job takes me to the capital or something. Uh, so they tend to then go back to their neighborhood and go, okay, I don't want to live with my parents anymore because I don't have to, and you know they've got. Their own concerns. They don't need me living there, right? I'm just in the way. Uh, there's, I've got siblings that are there. Whatever, right? They they don't want to be a burden because there's no reason for them to be, and they want their own space because they can, and they kind of want to show off a little bit to their neighbors. Sure, that's natural. And so they go and find one of the neighbors nearby. They generally look for something like across the street or next door, and they either wait for someone to be like, oh, "I gotta get rid of my house. Are you interested?" Or they're like, "Hey." Your house isn't that great. <laughs> I'll just pay you more than it's worth. And people are like, great. And they, you know, sell out, take, take what they can get. And then they often knock it down and build something really nice, right? So, I mean, it can work any given way, but this happens a lot. So when people move up in the socioeconomic positioning within Nicaraguan society, they quite often remain within a few hundred meters of the place that they grew up. And so they're not going out and just taking off and going to a completely different place. They are remaining there. And so there's this mix of socioeconomic status in any given location in a way that uh, in the U.S. or Canada is much less likely. Of course it can happen, right? But in the U.S. or Canada, you're very likely to have people who are at least in very similar housing, very similar commutes, very similar cars. You're not going to have a Ferrari in one yard and a beat-up Pinto in another. No one has a beat-up Pinto anymore. But you know what I mean. And in uh, Nicaragua, to have a really fancy Toyota Land Cruiser, you know, with all the bells and whistles in a really nice two, three-story house next door to someone who's riding their bicycle to work would never consider having a car and has, you know, 12 people living in a very small house is completely normal. And no one would think anything weird of it. And there isn't this, oh, you know, you're better because you make more money. You're lucky, right? But you're not better. They don't have this socioeconomic um, um, uh, view of the world in the way that Americans do. And I'm not saying that Americans are bad for that. It's just, it's different, right? And so there, it's easy coming from North America to kind of have this feeling that your socioeconomic status is going to make you naturally separate. Now, I don't think that's true. I think speaking English is going to make you naturally separate. I think there's a lot of things that you do in life, like, oh, man, I really want some air conditioning tonight. The Nicaraguans are like, I don't care. So if you're going out to the local bar in the barrio, you're going to find people of all socioeconomic status in that bar. You're going to find everybody, just people who are from that neighborhood hanging out with family and friends and people they grew up with and just because they live there. So it doesn't really matter where you go. Now, some of the absolute poorest areas that are like shanty towns, of course, you're going to find people try to move out of them as soon as they have the opportunity, but they don't tend to move very far away. And that's a lot more isolated and increasingly more isolated as time moves on, as Nicaragua's middle class becomes a much bigger thing and the entire economic growth of the country continues on a really good, strong increase, which it's been doing for a number of years. So having lived here in 2015 and coming back in 2021 and visiting in between, we've seen such an unbelievable change in housing and, and just the way that people go to do entertainment and shopping This has changed so much. So I think for people who are especially living in the barrio and going out and doing things, which we're going to talk about a little bit in the second question, you're naturally going to, the same as anyone else, form friendships with uh, people in the community because you're going to be going out and, and you're going to meet them at your local bar, you're going to meet them at the local pizza shop, you're going to meet them at the local whatever, you're going to go out and listen to a band, they're going to be there. All those things, you're going to be running into people of all different status uh, through uh, society. And, and you just really, I don't think, have this barrier where people are like, I can't hang out with you because you earn more than me or you have more education than me or vice versa. I don't think people see things that way. That has a tendency. I understand that this happens throughout the world, but Americans especially have a tendency towards thinking of the world in terms of income and uh, uh, career status. And a lot of the world, especially like here in Nicaragua, we don't look at things that way. And partially that's because there's a super high unemployment rate. So the stigmas that come with being unemployed or having a lower income job don't necessarily exist or exist in the same way because there's so little opportunity. In America, we have a tendency to see things right or wrong, that people have opportunity and if they haven't seized on it, then 
that's sometimes something of their own making. And that's not always true. It's often not true. It's very often not true. But we are taught that that is part of the American vision, that you are upwardly mobile in an unlimited way, and everyone has opportunity. And to some degree, that's true, but it's to a much more limited degree than it is portrayed. And in a place like Nicaragua, a large portion of the population is not going to have those opportunities. They just, they don't have access necessarily to the same amounts of education. They don't have access to the same venture capital funding, private equity, upward mobility, open jobs. It, it's not like you are guaranteed you're going to find somewhere to work and then somewhere to advance to as long as you put in the time that or the effort or whatever. That doesn't exist. You may be able to do that, but it's not everyone. And so because it's a forced thing of the economy at this time, that there are going to be a noticeable number of people who are simply in the wrong place at the wrong time and there's nothing they can do about it. There isn't the stigma. There's still a very unfortunate circumstance, but there's not a stigma associated with struggle in that way, with financial struggle. And so uh, I think that does a lot to break down those barriers. And you see it all the time. You go out to the bars, especially if we go to like a more upscale place where there's like a little bit more expensive food, there's live music, there's stuff going on, and you find a lot of people, including expats, hanging out. You will find all walks of Nicaraguan life hanging out equally there without any problem uh, because everyone just comes together and it's community in a different way. And of course, being a small country, there's a sense of community in other ways. And there's just a lot of things that have bonded the nation uh, as a single people um, in ways that, that many larger places just would struggle to do. And uh, so I think if you are it, living in and, and not setting yourself apart from Nicaraguans, you are going to absolutely integrate very quickly and find that making friends is completely transparent. You will have some amount of this barrier that's like, oh, that's difficult. And you'll have some amount of you're a foreigner and that just makes you interesting and that makes things easy. And that combination, I think, will lean more towards the easy than the difficult. And it varies for different people. But I think on average, you're going to find that may, for us, I know for sure, we found making friends in Nicaragua easier than making friends when we moved to Texas. And so we already have more friends here after three years of living here continuously than we did in 11 years in Texas, for example. And we did have, we have, still have many friends from Texas, but the pace at which we, we gain them here is completely different. Uh, and, and I don't think that's unique to us. I think you will find that as well. Of course, the more Spanish you learn, the faster and easier it will be. For example, hang out with expats who rarely hang out with other expats. I know that sounds counterproductive, but if you can find expats who are only hanging out with expats once in a while and mostly hanging out with Nicaraguans, that's going to probably pull you in pretty quickly. They'll introduce you to people. You'll just, you'll fit in. If this is something that you care about, it's not going to be a problem. I think that's the easiest way to look at it. Now, if you're in one of those other situations where you're, you know, if you're completely in an enclave and you never go out, obviously making friends is going to be hard because you're never going to run across people to become friends with simple as that. But if you fall into the other category, yes, you live in an enclave or something that a approximates an enclave, you're in a gated community, it's all expats, you're really not day to day, you, you know, your next door neighbor, the people you see when you look out the window, they're not Nicaraguans, they're expats. But you still want to go out and meet, meet people. Sorry, I have the hiccups now. I think you won't have a problem. Will it be as easy as the person who's living in the barrio and, and all the neighbors and everyone is Nicaraguans all day long? No, it will not be as easy, but it will not be hard. You can still go to the bar. You can still do things in your local neighborhood. You can still go out and seek other neighborhoods. You can go explore the country. You can go to live music events. You can go to whatever. Go watch parades. Go watch uh, the events in the, in the city centers, like the plazas often have cultural events. Uh, do that stuff, right? And that will launch you forward very quickly. The more you go out, it doesn't matter where you go home to, uh, and of course, living in, in a gated area, Nicaraguans may want to come over and hang out with you because it's, a, it's just an area they don't get to see very often. Now, the last thing I want to mention on that topic is because of the socioeconomic disparity that may exist, one of the things that people tend to find difficult is that uh, when you have a much higher income than the people you're hanging out with, it can be difficult to figure out, you know, at what point do you start paying for things? And that can for, for many people, especially Americans, that can lead to what feels like friction in a friendship. And for me, my personal opinion on that is, in general, 
um, when living here, there is this disparity and it's best to just embrace that disparity and say, look, I know I make a lot more money than the people I'm around. When I lived in Texas, a lot of my friends were younger. Like I started my career early. I started my career at 13. I owned my own company at 22. Um, like I've worked hard and been at different life stages than my friends who are the same age. So for much of my life, there's definitely been reversals at times, but that for much of my life, I was in a much higher socioeconomic class than my childhood friends. And most of them were not in a position where, oh, they couldn't pay for a beer, they couldn't pay for food. But if we wanted to do something often like, oh, we're going to Disney World for a vacation, I may have to put up some of that money. And, and that was fine because I had worked and I wanted to be able to hang out with my friends and it, I didn't care, right? Because this is how we get to do fun things together. Like there's things I want to do that they can't afford to do. Would they want to do it too? They just can't afford it. Well, why would I not have fun and make it fun for them? Of course I would. So I did. And that made sense. And when I lived in Texas, some of my, my closest friends, they were much lower income than us. They were also much younger. Uh, they were like going through university. They were working as, you know, service industry when I was a professional on Wall Street. And it's like, okay, yeah, we get to do way more things if I pay for things. And it just made life much better not worrying about that stuff. And the same thing here. In many cases, I find that you know, there are things that you can help with. You can make a difference in people's lives, whether it's actually helping them with something or it's, you know, going out for beers and they're like, you know, you know, they're on a lean budget. You're like, you know, I'm going to buy you some beers. First of all, everything's cheap, right? It's not an expensive country. You're not spending a lot of money, but the little bit you spend could make a huge difference to someone, either in allowing them to go out when they couldn't go out otherwise, or perhaps uh, allowing them to afford to do things that they need to do when they would have gone out anyway and just put themselves into a bad financial situation to try to hang out with you. And I don't want, I know personally it would really bother me if my friends were spending money they didn't have in order to hang out with me. Because for me, going out and getting a beer, maybe some, you know, a burger and fries with my friends is a completely non-thought financial ex uh, expense, right? I spent $2 more than I would have spent eating at home. I, I'm not even going to think about that. But for them, this may be a, I wasn't going to eat anything but rice and beans tonight, but I want to hang out. And now I'm going to drop five, six dollars going out to hang out with me. And, and that's money they may not have really had in, in disposable income and in, in, you know, discretionary expenditure. And so if I'm able to, for that very little money, be like, Hey, no, I got your burger. I got your beer. Make that difference that they can be like, oh, this is a comfortable thing and I don't, they don't have to worry about the money. They don't have to worry about, you know, oh, I kind of want a second beer. Like, uh, I got you, right? And you know, uh, what a lot of people do here is they order a bottle of rum, rum and a bottle of Coke and everyone shares it. And people who can chip in do and those who can't, can't. There's, there's ways. Um, but I know a lot of Americans often feel like this is a problem. If I do that, people are going to be expecting me to pay all the time. And I think there's a happy medium. You don't want to be just bailing everyone out all the time. You don't want to be paying for everything. You don't want to be, you know, walking around throwing money around. But there's also a very casual like, oh, no, I got this. Like, it's cool. Like, we're hanging out. I want you to be able to hang out and not worry about what it costs for us to go out and do things. Um, and uh, that has been my take on that all along. And, and you know, 90, 95% of the time, it works out great. Every once in a while, it doesn't. That's going to be the case no matter what. I have a much better overall life. I don't have to worry about things. I would much rather be, you know, in that 5 to 10%, it didn't go that great position than giving up all these great opportunities and making all these people pay for things that they can't afford to. I'm not saying that I pay for people all the time. It doesn't really come up that often. But when it needs to, I, I have very much a I don't worry about it position. And I know people who ask me all the time, well, what about this? This situation came up and I don't know if I should pay for this. Is that going to, if you're even thinking about it, just pay for it. That is my, that is not like a, a strong recommendation. That's my personal take on it. That's how I see it. Like I just, I don't want to ever be at risk of having been somehow a financial burden on someone or making someone feel like they couldn't hang out with us because they couldn't afford to. Uh, and, and that's, that has made me feel much better about the social interactions. And yes, sometimes people are going to be like, Oh, I kind of going to choose to hang out with you because you're going to pay for things. 
But you know what? That's how life is. And sometimes, you know, you have to choose between it's going to cost me to go out, but if I go out, something, you know, someone's going to provide something. These are normal human interactions. And, and seeing that as a very strong negative, I think is foolish. But Americans have a tendency to be brought up that you can't look at things that way. But in most of the world, there's a much better understanding, I think, of that when you don't have anything and you have an opportunity for someone to take care of you a little bit, that that's not a negative and it doesn't imply that you don't care about that person and you don't care about that interaction. It's just that money is more important to you because you don't have access to it. When Americans are like, I'm not going to pay for you, that's because that other person essentially always has the ability to go out and earn that money and probably already has that money and could do those things. And they're just not working as hard as you or not not put in the time, right? I, there's a lot of times where people are like, well, why, why can you pay for this? Why don't I? Well, because you bought, you know, you're, you're buying cigarettes and that costs money. Oh, I didn't buy cigarettes. Now I have to pay for you because you spent the money on something I didn't spend it on. That's not fair, right? That's, that's, you had an opportunity to shop and, and spend in the same way that I did and chose not to. Or I worked an 80 hour week. And this is a real thing. Like I always worked these huge long hour weeks. And then other people who work half a third as many hours as I do, didn't spend years and years and years studying to get into their fields, just, you know, took a job that came along, worked very few hours, and then are like, oh, can you pay for me? No, because you could go work extra hours. You could do these things and pay for it yourself. You're just choosing not to. That's very different. And I'm still not saying that you should never pay for people, right? But but it's a different mindset than this is someone who has no, they would love to work more hours. They would love to earn more. They'd love to have an opportunity to have studied and move into a different field. Those opportunities almost certainly didn't exist or they weren't aware of them or whatever. And, and often don't exist today. Like they would like more work. It's not there. So helping in that situation is a completely different thing. And I would say pretty strongly, if you are on the fence, err on the side of taking care of people. Do not err on the side of thinking that people um, accepting when you pay for things or maybe going out more when you pay for things or whatever. Don't look at that as a negative. Don't think of it that way. That is an inappropriate mindset given the socioeconomic situation that the majority of people you're going to interact with are under. And, and, you know, one of the best examples I have is uh, a number of years ago, Paul, my roommate now and business partner, uh, we went to Panama. We were in um, a valle in the, in the center of the country. And we went out to a barrio bar in the jungle. And it was in a barn, like one lit bulb swinging in there. And we had a few people with us. And we got in there and we're like, you know what, this place is not lively. Let's just buy beer for the whole place. And we walked up to the bar. We're like, we're buying beer for everyone. And the guy's like, this is insane. We're like, no, it's not. And he's like, there's like 20, I don't know, if there, I think it was 80 people in there. And we're like, oh, okay, two beers for everyone. Just make it happen. And people were so thrilled. They, you know, a lot of people had gone out. It was a big expense to get one beer. They couldn't afford more. It was a very poor region. It was a very poor bar. And suddenly it was... This was a gift and meaningful and people really appreciate it. And people came up and gave us hugs and thanked us. They had to assign a person to be like, okay, so just say thank you and move on. Like there was such a line of people coming there. Like, please don't harass them anymore. And it was, but it was so felt as a, it's something that, that made a difference to people. Even, yeah, it was just an evening and a beer. But when that's something that you save up a little bit for, maybe you only get a couple a week, getting a gift of a beer is a it is a real symbol of, of a, a token, right? Of something, it, it actually means something. It's not just this, this empty, like, yeah, sure, I bought you a beer, you, you know, it means nothing. This was, we made an effort and, and it was felt. Uh, and I think that carries on, that, that, that ability to make a difference um, makes sense. And when you have that disparity, when you have so much opportunity, for most of you, this doesn't apply to everyone, right? But when you're in this, this high disparity situation and you have an opportunity to make so much of a difference for them, and there's a million things that they may be able to do for you, right? Their time, their, their knowledge, their effort. There's all these things that likely that friendship will mean in positive ways for you that are big things for them to give up, but money they can't. And for you, money is something that for most of us, we can give up, even if not a lot, a little bit, and make a really big difference for someone 
we shouldn't look at it as that they had the same opportunity to get that money. Even moving forward, every day, as expats, we have so much more access to the possibility of earning money than the average Nicaraguan by a huge margin that um, it's not just a result of disparity. It is a disparity of opportunity that carries forward every day. And when you think of it that way, I think it becomes much easier to approach it and see why it's easy to make friends across that barrier and how to think of it. All right, on to question number two from Andrea. Scott, how do you learn about local events? The next time we're in Nicaragua, we want to start to integrate into local culture much more, but it's hard to know what to do and where to go. So this yeah, this is a big one, right? And this is something that Nicaragua struggles with. So first of all, get to know locals. I know it just goes back to the first question. Solve the first question, it'll solve the second one, right? Okay, but this is big. Word of mouth is how things work here in Nicaragua. Of course, there is quite a bit on Facebook. So hop on Facebook, get on the right groups. I don't do this. I do not have a Facebook account at all. I don't mean I don't use one. I don't have one. So I do zero of this, but I know a lot of people do, and they do find out a certain amount of stuff. I don't know that it's that great. I don't know that you're going to find the right groups. I skip that. Twitter, I hate, but it actually has some good things. Follow all the in-tours, or at very least, the main in-tour Nicaragua and in-tour your city. So I live in Leon, in-tour Leon. I follow all the in-tours, uh, so uh, and I'm perfectly happy to jump in the car and be like, there's a corn festival in Matagalpa, let's go, and go spend the weekend there, right? Which is a cool thing to do, so consider that, of course. But at very least, follow the national and your departmentos uh, uh, in-tour, that's the Department of Tourism, uh, Twitter, and that you'll at least get some high-level things that they're pushing on there that will generally work. The local hostels, if you go do that stuff, they will often have information about events going on. And of course, as you make friends, people will tell you. But for example, we have a tendency, there's a certain group of expats and a lot of Nicaraguans who go to Via Via here in Leon, this is just in Leon, on Friday nights. We know that there's live music and people get together and they discuss the events that are coming up. That is generally one of the best ways to do it is that word of mouth. Now, acknowledging that this is a problem, one of the things that we're working on is nikarumba.com, uh, which you should totally check out. Make sure you bookmark that, use that. That is increasing all the time in how much coverage it has for events around Nicaragua. Uh, right now, it's primarily Leon with decent coverage in like Esteli and Managua, but we're working on getting um, sports into that. Right now, there's no sports. Uh, working on getting it into San Juan del Sur and other regions, expanding its capability. But that list, like concerts and, and cultural events on a regular basis, that works really, really well. Uh, and if you're in an area that it doesn't have well covered, contact uh, Nika Roomba through us and we can help you get that going. And that would be a great way to get to know people in your community, right? Go find a band, go find a venue and be like, hey, you got live music. Why aren't you listening to it on Nika Roomba? It's free. You should list it on there so people can find out about it. And then they would be like, it's free in Nicaragua? What are you talking about? And they would jump on and be super excited. Let me tell you, every restaurant, every bar that finds out about Nicaragua is like, this is the best thing ever. So they list their events. That's how people can find it. You can subscribe and do all this stuff. And then the bands, same thing. They're like, wait, we can tell Nicaragua whenever we're playing so our, our fans can follow us places. And it really helps. I've been to shows where people come up to me and they're like, we found this on Nicaragua. We would never have known to go to a different city to see this event if it wasn't on there. So that is really rapidly increasing in being a way to find all kinds of events because anybody can put stuff on there. It could be little bands playing at a little hole in the wall restaurant. It could be major events being put on by the government. It could be big international concerts going on. All that kind of stuff is listed on there and we're hoping soon sporting events are starting to start getting li listed. We're talking to some of the people who deal with uh, national pickleball about getting that stuff. So like, like a local tournament or a t may, you know maybe a thing to watch may also be a thing for you to go participate in like uh, it may be, oh, the national skateboarding competition is going on, so go watch that. Or it could be, hey, there's a, a pickleball open thing. It's just a chance for people to go play, and, and it's going to be, you know, at this time or whatever. Those kinds of things are trying to get in there because there's a fair amount of sports here, right? There's boxing, baseball, soccer, American football. A lot of people aren't aware of a lot of these different things. And like pickleball apparently is in a lot more of the country than anyone knew. There's no one organizing it. And now I'm starting to find... 
by being on foot, that there's kickball going on in different places, and there's just a lot of sports going on. It's a country full of sports and parades and that kind of stuff. And right now, even those of us who've been here for a long time, there's a parade that's supposed to be happening in Managua. We were talking about going to it two days ago, and every time we talk to someone, they're like, "That's not the right day. That's not the right day. That's not the right day." And at the end of the day, you just have to know someone who happens to know.、Uh, that's a big struggle right now. So there's no easy answer. But using Facebook, using Twitter, definitely getting on Nika Rumba and talking to your neighbors and start asking, "Hey, is there anything going on?" Or you know, what are you guys doing? Because there is something every couple days. There's a religious thing all the time. The churches are always putting on events. The city is always putting on events. The federal government is always putting on events. There's just constantly stuff. So as an example, here in Leon, you can go most weekends to the city、uh, plaza, the main plaza in front of the cathedral. There's almost always something going on. And as but there's almost Probably not every weekend, but at least once a month, if not twice, there's something going on at the main plaza in Sutiava. Now it gets a little bit less during the rainy season, but during the dry season, it is constant, and often it is things like a carnival or a circus. Now I know most of you aren't looking to go out to the circus, and I'm not saying I would recommend it, but I have heard it can be really interesting, and so. That just you just have to keep an eye open for it. I have no idea where they announce it. I do know that they do put a lot of this stuff on the radio. If you're not listening to the radio in Spanish, that's hard.、Um, and they do post things in like some weird, random places. You'll find things just posted on walls, places. That stuff does happen. And of course, there are some places that you can get to know. For example, the movie theater here in Leon. They don't post. Any、um, you know in a service, but you go to their website and it does list everything they have, and of course Instagram is big as well. So if there's things you're interested in, such as the Ipico events, follow people who are interested in the Ipico.、Uh, for example, some of the people who work for、uh, whether it's. One of the farms that does the horse shows, or it's one of the、uh, boot companies that does advertising at the shows. Whatever, follow one of their accounts, and chances are they'll be telling you when they're going to be at it. Nipico, you can go to theirs.、Uh, it is a challenge to know when things are, and it is something we are attempting to tackle because it's super important. And、uh, I think we have a really good solution for it in Nika Rumba, but that's going to take time.、Um, of course. Go check out the website. Also, subscribe to Nika Rumba on YouTube,、uh, and definitely for anyone who hasn't, go check out the latest show of、uh, Haiti Gayo and the Roosters. That is by far the best concert、uh, quality of recording that has ever been done on that channel, and shows kind of where that channel is going. Really good video, really good audio, great concert,、uh, and gives you an idea of what Friday nights at Via Via here in Leon are like. Go check that out. I think it's worth it. Subscribe to that, and and those. Kind of channels will build up, and you'll kind of get an idea. But you're going to struggle until Nika Rumba has all the major players like sending information into it automatically. It's going to be hard. It really is.、Um, but there's so much going on that kind of just hanging loose and being willing to do things, getting to know other people. Like for us, just knowing expats. Uh, does help a lot because some of them talk to the right people or are involved in something, and they'll be like, "Hey, are you going to the parade this weekend?" You'll be like, "What? There's a parade!" And then you can go or hang out. The Ipico is right. A lot of us like to go together, drink all day, watch the horses, and so you may be able to tag along to some of those things as well. Now, I hope that helps.、Uh, I know. You know, I think I think part one we had really good answers. Part two, it's like this is a challenge. It really is, but don't feel badly that you're struggling with it. Everyone is. Even Nicaraguans are like, how do we find things? Is is a universal problem、um, that needs to be solved. All right, thanks for joining me. We do have our new membership, so if anyone's interested, go down and check that out. Sorry, I forgot to turn the light back on after I had stopped to have a quick pizza, and、uh, he's now in the dark.、Um, so that's unfortunate. Let me know if you liked him being lit up at the beginning. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com/scottallenmiller. That comes directly to me. It's like Patreon makes all this possible, or our membership, where you can subscribe and and have just like a small monthly payment that helps support the channel. All that really makes a big difference. I appreciate so much everyone who does that. It really does help pay for all the things that we do, the cameras and lights and all this stuff, and trips and activities and all those kinds of things. And、uh, I will see. All of you, and、uh, before I forget, tomorrow is the live stream. So be sure to tune in for that. We are planning to do it, and I will see you all tomorrow.